Today I want to talk to our hearts about when God calls a champion. When you hear the word champion, what comes to mind? I looked this word up and here are a few synonyms that were given in the definition of the word. Winner, victor, advocate. And I thought this one was really encouraging. Title holder. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't feel much like a champion. In fact, you may feel more like a loser. You've taken a whooping from the enemy over the course of the week. You feel defeated, frustrated, not like a champion at all. You're tired of the struggle, tired of failing, tired of racking up losses, more losses than wins in your walk with the Lord. You know what, church, family, I've been there. Seminarians, preachers, pastors, ministers, Christian workers of various kinds are certainly not exempt from these types of feelings and failings. In James chapter 3, verse 2, it states that we all stumble in many ways. Consequently, we experience a sense of defeat. We become frustrated when we fail in the face of temptation and adversity. I believe that Satan especially targets pastors and Bible teachers, evangelists, missionaries, and those kinds of Christian workers, even more so because we are engaged in the business of growing the people of God in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But please don't make the mistake of thinking that because you're not involved in Christian service vocationally, that you're off limits to the enemy. You may not be in vocational ministry, but you are certainly in ministry. I said you're in ministry. That is the ministry of evangelism. Every single believer has been called to be an evangelist and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who don't know him. So we all have a target on our back. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 18, we read, Be of sober spirit, be on your alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Unfortunately, at times, we choose not to be of sober spirit, and consequently, we fail. In doing so, we relinquish our right to feel like the champion that God has called us to be. God has an encouraging word for us this morning, church. I believe that God's word to us is a meditative one. It's a transformative one. It's a message that I have simply titled, When God Calls a Champion. Gideon, who we'll look at briefly for our study this morning, is one of the judges that God has raised up to deliver his people Israel from the oppressive hand of heathen nations. Turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Judges 6, 11, and 12. It reads, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was at Aphra, which belonged to Joash, the Abezrite, as his son Gideon, Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. 
Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Gideon is an unlikely hero. In this sense, he's similar to another biblical giant in scripture who is heralded as being the greatest leader that Israel has ever known, the prophet Moses. Gideon and Moses initially doubted that God was able to pull off the impossible. Yet, despite their doubt, God patiently moved them from cowardice to courage. From faith to fear. I'm sorry, from fear to faith and from victimization to victory. In fact, these great men of God are listed in God's roll call of the heroes of faith found in Hebrews chapter 11. And let's go there and look at verses 32 through 34. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 34. The writer of Hebrews states, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. In summary fashion, the author recounts the phenomenal accomplishments of these great men of faith in these few verses. Notice in particular what he ascribes to Gideon and others who served the Lord in a militaristic role, putting foreign armies to flight. And as we just read in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, Gideon was in a wine press beating out wheat. Not a real manly job, particularly in that kind of culture. And when you read chapter 1 in Judges, you discover that the Israelites were actually living out of caves because they were hiding from the Midianites that were ravishing their nation, coming in and raiding them, stealing their crops and their flocks, and we understand that they were in that situation because God had judged them for their great disobedience. When you read about these men prior to their call and subsequent magnanimous achievements, you might find yourself asking the question, who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? It's kind of like watching the presidential candidate Donald Trump rising in the polls. Who would have thunk it? I don't know what his poll rating is currently, but a few weeks ago he was number one. But what is interesting to me is that it pleases God to take the weak and lowly and use them to bring down the strong and mighty. In 1 Corinthians, I got a few scripture passages. Church, uh, if you don't mind turning to these passages with me. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I firmly believe that it is in the word of God that we find comfort, we find strength, and we find the ability to live out what it means to be God's champion. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Paul states, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chose the foolish things 
of the world to shame the wise. He has chosen the weak things of the world to shame those things which are strong and the base things of the world, the despised things of the world, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. And while Paul encourages us in this passage and elsewhere in Scripture to have a sober view of ourselves, he does not negate the very real fact that we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. More than conquerors. Romans 8.37, Paul writes, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The phrase, all these things, is a reference to the many and various tests, temptations, trials, and tribulations that the people of God, the champion of God, may expect to encounter as he strives after God. In fact, if a professing Christian never experiences any kind of adversity, I submit to you that you might want to ask yourself the question, is my service for and unto the Lord effective? Is it impactful? Is it real? Or am I just simply going through the motions? Unlike a lot of you, I wasn't raised in church. The streets of Harlem, New York City was my church. And so I don't know what it's like to play church. I'm just a for real brother trying to be a for real disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I got saved when I was 18 watching a televangelist. And all I recall is that he was preaching on hell. And I knew I didn't want to go to hell, Pastor. Because I had seen the exorcist when I was in sixth grade and I was still reeling with terror from that movie. I said, I don't want to go there if Linda Blair's there with her head turning around and no. But these are serious questions that we need to ask ourselves. Is my relationship with Christ real? Or am I just doing this religious thing because I was raised to do it? And because I live in Texas where a lot of folk are religious, a lot of folk, especially black folk, they, they are church-going folk. But did you know you can be religious and wind up in hell? Did you know you could be a church-going folk and wind up in hell? Miss heaven because you missed embracing the Messiah with a heart of faith. The story of Gideon is at its core really a story about how God works with people, what he does with people who have shaky faith and fearful hearts. Brothers and sisters, when God calls a champion and he is calling his church to be champions who will individually and collectively accomplish his kingdom agenda, he qualifies us to deliver a championship performance. In other words, not if, but since. Each of us has been called to be his champion. He will equip. He will empower. He will enable us to accomplish and win in every area of our lives. Gideon's story is a clear example of this. 
as we read about Gideon's rise to a position of militaristic leadership over Israel, we see God qualifying him for this important role in three ways. And since I'm an educator, I'd feel really encouraged if y'all would take out a pen and a piece of paper. Come on, students. And uh, do some note taking. I do have three observations that I believe God has impressed upon my heart to share with you this morning based on the narrative of Gideon in Judges 6 through 8. First, God equips Gideon with courage. courage. And we see that in verse 12, verse 34. And Gideon is going to need a lot of courage because of the assignment that God was about to give him. The Midianites, again, they had been wreaking havoc throughout the promised land that belonged to Israel. And because their suffrage was so intense, they cried aloud to the Lord, beseeching the Lord their God for mercy. And God responded by raising up this great judge, Gideon. Now they reneged on their agreement, their promise to obey God. And consequently, they were not enjoying the produce of the land, the promised land that flowed with milk and honey. And brothers and sisters, just as God has empowered Gideon to reverse this dismal situation, and that's precisely what he did, he has equipped us with courage, boldness, to turn things around in our lives for God's glory. You ought to turn to your neighbor and say, you're a champion of God. That's right. Champion of God. Paul said, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Secondly, when God calls a champion, he commands us to confront adversity not to run from it but to confront it and despite what we might hear on television by the so-called prosperity gospel preachers who unfortunately misread and misinterpret scripture and they promulgate a message that is totally out of alignment in concert with the biblical message that is as Christians, we should never ever suffer. Uh, we should never get sick. We shouldn't struggle financially. Uh, we should be able to, as it were, storm the throne room of God and demand of God whatever our hearts desire. Listen, family, I've been through this book more than a few times from cover to cover and I've never seen such a message. What I have found is that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I, I have found verses like that. I, I have read where Jesus said, blessed are you when men curse you and say all manner of evil against you falsely on account of me. I've read in the Gospel of John where Jesus was saying to his disciples before he was crucified that if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So God doesn't expect us to run from adversity because he's the God with us in our adversity. And we have that assurance from the Lord that he will get us to the other side. Question, what has God commanded of you? What has he commanded of you to confront?
If we are not confronting issues in our lives that impede our walk with the Lord, the question that we must pose to ourselves is why not? Why not? Are you confronting that all besetting sin in your life that is preventing you from being a champion for God? And if you're not, why not? Are you confronting that lackadaisical, nonchalant attitude that you have with respect to practicing the seven essentials, spiritual disciplines? Do you have this kind of blasé, blasé attitude when it comes to serving God? As the coordinator of the safety ministry here at NEBC, I need brothers to step up and say, Sledge, put me on your roster to stand ready to help guard the church of God. I want to be part of that entourage. And yet I'm having to ask my men to work double and sometimes triple duty. Maybe adversity is simply an attitude that, hey, as long as I show up to church and toss God a few dollars every now and then, I'm good. That's not the level of commitment that our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to. He said, if you're going to follow me, be ready to die. Die to self every day. He said, take up your cross and follow me. And when he took up his cross, he was going to one place. That was the hill of the skull, Golgotha, to die. There's a third qualifier that God grants us when he calls us to be a champion. He grants us conquest. We say victory. God told Gideon that this conquest over the Midianites was a done deal. We see that in verses 14, 36 through 40. Chapter 7, verses 13 through 15. And family, again, like Gideon, and keep in mind, these narratives in the Old Testament were written for our betterment in the faith. They're not children's stories. You know, we have a tendency to uh, relegate stories like David and Goliath. Oh, that's a great children's ministry story. That's part of God's revelation to us to help us grow in the faith. And so is the story of Gideon. And just like God granted Gideon conquest, victory over his adversary, the Midianite army, God has granted us victory over any adversity in our lives and I feel your pain family it, it doesn't feel good when we're in the midst of trials fiery trials James describes them as being doesn't feel good but I like the fact that Jesus said get in the boat we're going to the other side and the disciples they got in the boat everything was fine until that storm hit and when that tumultuous storm began to roar and to rage, they started to panic. Help! Where's Jesus? The scripture says Jesus was asleep in the boat. Asleep. And they ran to him saying, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Jesus popped up and rebuked the storm and said, what the problem is? Oh, you men of little faith, did I not tell you we're going to the other side? God says you have the victory in Jesus. I love hymns, and one of my favorite hymns is, Oh, victory in Jesus, 
victory in Jesus. And dear brother or sister, if you came in this morning feeling defeated like less than a champion, please know that you have victory in Jesus. It's a done deal. And the moment you realize that, you can begin to enjoy and experience this blessed life that God has ushered into your heart because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 35 through 39, we have these encouraging words from the Apostle Paul. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? And y'all go there with me, church, if you would. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Paul writes, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Just as it is written, for our sake we are being put to death all the day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquer, conquerors through him who loved us. And I like the King James translation which renders that passage more than conquerors everybody say more than conquerors more than conquerors no reason to fail no reason to feel defeated or depressed no reason to continue to flounder as if we don't have the God of all creation residing on the inside of us the triune Godhead Father Son Holy Spirit, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen. More than conquerors. For I am convinced, I am convinced that neither life, death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, things present, nor things to come, not powers, height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Three qualifiers that God grants us when he calls us to be champions. And church, he has. When those outside the church see us, they ought to see champions. We ought to walk like champions, talk like champions. And I'm not talking about being arrogant, going around claiming this and claiming that. But we ought to be confident and fully assured that we are God's and he is ours and that we are a holy nation. We are a kingdom of priests and kings. And one day we will be ushered into his glorious and majestic presence to enjoy him forever. Courage, a command to confront adversity, and a guaranteed conquest. You ought to be feeling like a champion this morning. You ought to feel real good about your standing before God. Family, God has equipped us with all that we need to be champions and to be the champions that he has destined us to be. Last passage I want to share with you is in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, if you turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 20 through 21. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. 
Family, as I prepare to take my seat, you may be here this morning not realizing that you are a champion. And that's provided that you belong to God through Jesus Christ. I simply want to encourage you. Take God as at his word. Jesus said, I've overcome. And since we are part of his body, we overcome and can continue to overcome as well. Now, if you're outside of the body of Christ, then you need to join the winning team. Because right now you're on the losing team. I'll just be honest with you. You can't be a champion if you're playing on a team that has a sub par performance. They're beneath the 500 mark in their ratings and uh, their standing is pretty deplorable. Well, the message to you is believe. Believe. We all know this verse. It's a wonderful verse. John writes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He who believes in him is not condemned. You're not a loser. But he who does believe is saved. And so that's the invitation to those of you outside of the body of Christ today. God wants us to enjoy what it means to be victorious in our lives. And if you will simply believe, it is a matter of faith. Come on into the family of God. Join the winning team. Church, God bless you. Thank you. For